Does everybody know about this research? Is everybody doing it this way? It's all brand new. It's, it's new as of many different studies have come out, and probably the most notable one uh, was a comparison of laser versus anti-vascular endothelial growth factor therapy for proliferative disease, the worst of the worst. Okay. And that study showed basically the patients gained more visual acuity and those patients who got anti-VEGF. Okay. I had a longer chance of keeping that visual acuity above the, the mark that they were at when they started. And uh, they avoided the need for additional surgery as a result of that, too. And so um, those patients who, who needed, you know, th th got those therapies had less laser over time and, and developed some benefits. So I think at this point, um, anti-VEGF therapy is probably the primary goal and primary way we treat most of the patients with both proliferative and uh, diabetic macular edema. Uh, and, and in that sense, we have a lot of great outcomes in those patients. Are our paying partners aware of this data and have you modified compared to 10 years ago what you're willing to pay for? We, we certainly do pay for these therapies. Um, and again, the, where the rubber meets the road is sometimes is the amount of the, the treatment or the, the treatment options as, as you were talking about in terms of some some differences in in, in these uh, in these anti-VEGF. So, but absolutely, they are you know recognized as part of the standard of care. Our medical policy people have acknowledged that, and certainly uh, uh, do not discourage. Uh, whether we encourage uh, is another question, but certainly do, we do encourage that these persons get seen and treated and, and, and treated by appropriate subspecialists who are qualified to make the best treatment decisions. You know, Peter, where the rubber meets the road, though, is, is to get these outcomes, number one, you need to do the same types of treatments that they did in the studies. And on average, that's eight or nine injections the first year. Mm -hmm. If you fall short of that, you're really not going to achieve those same the sort same of outcomes, outcomes, and you're going to leave vision on the table. The other controversial area for us as retina specialists is the DRCR, did a study called the DRCR Protocol T study where they actually compared all three of our commonly used anti-VEGF therapies, one of which is an off-label therapy. It's actually uh, Bevacizumab, which right. is an oncology right. product that we've been using for 10 years now off-label. We have it compounded, so there's an extra step in that, but it's the number one used anti-VEGF in the eye. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually showed that for those patients with better seeing vision, 20, 40 or better, that they did equally well with all the medicines. But if you take those patients that are 20, 50 or worse, they actually did better with one of the other anti-VEGF medicines. Not by a little bit, but by a lot, by about a line and a half. And so that's where we run into trouble with our payers, is when they go, you can only use the bevacizumab, which is about $50 an injection for the cost of the medication, and you can't use anything else unless this patient fails. And it's that definition of failure that paints us in a Okay, form. so how do you respond to that? Well, we absolutely do encourage the lower cost drug initially. And so the, the, the point is how, how the clinicians uh, influence us, and we, we certainly are available to that kind of, of clinical and, and evidence-based uh, medicine. So the, the folks that are involved with medical policy uh, at my organization uh, do pay very serious attention to those kinds of data and then making, changing our medical policy to reflect that. This all, of course, impinges on physician choice. Sure. Right? You may get a physician who's been using it. I'm going to try this now. You've had 10 years to work on it. Bevacizumab. How'd I do? Right. All right. right. And seen some good results with it, but doesn't know that there may be better results with something else. And so doesn't press the payers as hard. Is physician choice really critical to, to treating uh, DME? Well, I think that it's it's the preservation of physician choice at the end of the day. I mean, that's that's what I think is across medicine is really the the benefit there. And I understand the the policymakers and the healthcare organizations that want to mandate a certain uh, cookbook way of to, taking care of something. But the problem is, and that takes away sort of the art of medicine in some senses. We're kind of uh, hogtied to not do what necessarily what we think is in the best interest of the patient. We do what we think is but the the insurance company. But with all due respect, mm -hmm. what I've heard over the years, and I know you've heard too is don't tell me how to practice medicine, it's an art, which is occasionally an artful dodge, which is I like to do what I like to do. Don't confuse me with the latest research, don't confuse me with the all comers data that you've got. I want to do what I so want. So if that was true, we wouldn't have some of these therapies available to us because some of these things came out of the art of trying. Okay. And so if we had no way of doing those sort of things, if we didn't have a way of getting the, uh, that off-label medication or to see what happened when we switched patients on the higher, the better drug versus the, the cheaper drug and we saw better outcomes, 
we wouldn't be able to really determine what those outcomes are. So I think that that's a key fe feature where the art really helps. Yeah, the process. We're, we're looking at, at, at choice based on evidence. So so that is that becomes a really a sine qua non is okay. is, is is there evidence? I, interestingly, on this art of medicine, which I really enjoy talking about, it's also bringing back the joy to the practice of medicine. Is that one of my physician colleagues? who is a uh, primary care physician says, I'm increasingly, as I get into my 60s, more, more uh, influencing the, the, the uh, behaviors of my patients. And I really feel like that's where I can have even more influence than all of the MRIs and PET CTs and Fair things enough. like that. Again, not to be a nihilist toward technology. Goodness knows there's some amazing advances, anti-VEGF among those. But he, you know, it was, a, it was a great insight from him that in terms of uh, the trajectory of patients' diseases, their problems, their overall health and well-being. If I may interpret, he's treating patients, not numbers, yeah. patients, not statistics. Yeah. Um, the humanism, just... the art. All right. Yeah, he's got, Steve's got a great point. I think that one of the nice things about this revolutionary treatment that we have is, is it gives us an opportunity to message our patients with hope. Diabetic patients always hear bad news. They're never gonna get better, they're always gonna get worse, their kidneys are gonna fail, and if they don't do a really good job, it's gonna happen quicker. We can actually take those patients in now and show them their pictures, show them their scans, explain to them what's going on, and say, guess what, I'm gonna make this better. You know, it, it occurs to me that this is what we used to say to people with ischemic heart disease. There's nothing we can do, the calcium's gonna grow, soft plaque's gonna kill you, and then along came statins. And what do you know, their risks went down, not just below where we started, but below baseline. Am I, am I interpreting this right? Is that what we're talking about here? I think, if, I think it's an order of magnitude even higher. Wow, that's very, very impressive. So if we take all